Woo. We're just a couple natural guys in this uh, episode today talking about hunks, hot guy babes, and anabolic steroids. Yep, things that go hand in hand in hand. <laughs> yep, three hands, which means you need more than one person. You do the math. Correct. You figure out what that means. Three hands, <laughs> hunks, hot guy babes. <laughs> hey, Eric. <laughs> is it going? Yes? Is it me or is it getting hot in here, man? I don't know. Is it? Uh, as soon as this call started, I was just sweating. <laughs> yeah. Sweating bullets. Yeah, it's not. Ooh, that's also a Megadeth song, interestingly enough. I was going to say maybe. Shout mayhaps. out James Krieger. Yeah, hey. Hey, when we have them on, people that are listening to this, they're like, oh, man, your lineup's really good. Just wait, okay? We're constantly mm. improving. We believe in the continuous process of self-improvement through um, just torturing ourselves, stepping on stage, breaking down our bodies. I'm going to be doing that in the future when I do some weightlifting. But, you know, continuous, Eric, process of self-improvement. Right. As we learned from Chip Conrad... <laughs> We want to have an abusive relationship with our body where we torture ourselves into progress. Yeah. It's kind of like if you were Milo of Croton, but instead of carrying around this loving calf that you nurtured from a childhood age who made you better, it's like carrying around a ball and chain that you also pick up off the ground and whip yourself with in yes. kind of a flagellation style. Yep. So uh, and then you add load to it over time. Yep. And then if you get hurt from the ball and chain, uh, you just train harder. Yeah, yeah, because you're not man enough. Let's be honest. It all has to do with your masculinity and your identity of self. And the mm. ball is a great metaphorical representation of the trauma that we should self-inflict. Um, yes. We're not about trying to build ourselves up. We're trying to no. break everything down. And Chip's book actually was called Are You Useful? And I think we can answer the question, no. Yeah, the answer is no, and we should change the title to Do You Hate Yourself? And I think that's a good transition of how we can talk about anabolic steroids. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are the transition king. Yeah, it's because if you just say the word transition and then you change the subject, it's a good transition. Yep. Um, no, but actually, just so we don't waste too much time, yep. uh, it was really awesome to have uh, Alex Coliari turner on. Yep. Um, He's a, a really bright young lad, and I emphasize lad because he is from the United Kingdom. Uh, he, he, he's, a, he's a man of the queen, and uh, he's bringing the science, the real science. Um, man, when I hear about the stuff he's doing, looking at uh, anabolic signaling pathways and uh, you know molecular level changes in muscle, looking at, at uh, basically how does anabolic steroids affect uh, muscle at, at the uh, the most basic level uh, after it's been stopped and then restarted uh, and looking at all kinds of cool changes. Uh, he's doing some really groundbreaking research and I think you'll all be very intrigued. And he's got a really good grasp of, of kind of the history of anabolics and the perspective on doping and, and what's involved in that uh, that goes beyond your average, you know, 17-year-old uh, YouTube commenter, <laughs> uh, who of course is an expert in their own right. If Google you Scholar experts. is equally valid. I don't even know that the person I'm talking about knows what Google Scholar is, oh. but they definitely have used Google at least, <laughs> which is half of that, which is just as good. So anyway, no, it was pretty awesome to have Alex on, that's for sure. Yeah, man, I was pleasantly surprised. You actually connected me uh, with Alex, and when I began speaking with him, I was surprised, and I don't mean any insult, but you know, you have a variety of different guests, how eloquent he was, and he was able to talk on his feet. We did a few videos, and then we want to talk because this is the culture, and we want to explore all, every single aspect of it, and we believe in informed choice. The history of anabolic steroids, the science behind it, and then also taking a look at drug testing, how far along it has come, because Alex is fighting the good fight. If you want to compete and you want to compete tested, there is kind of that jaded internet mindset. With, oh, man, you can never, you can never test all things. And you really see mm. Alex being at the forefront. How big of an improvement when he compares the Beijing 2008 results when it comes to weightlifters, 2012 London, how much progress yeah. is being made for, let's say, a drug tested or hopefully really drug free sport or sports. Yeah, I can understand the perspective of some, someone saying, hey, if drug testing is so shitty, then we just shouldn't do it. Um, but we're actually at a stage now where that, and I, 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 can, I don't necessarily agree with that stance. I don't know that I have a strong stance on it. Um, it's easy to punt when you're in uh, natural bodybuilding and, and powerlifting because there's two very clear pathways. And the Olympics is a whole different animal with societal pressure, uh, team pressures, potentially 
doping programs you are either not or are actually aware of, depending on if we're talking about the 80s or now, and state-sponsored. Man, it's, it's, it's a crazy thing, and it's very nuanced. So, so I don't have a strong position there. But uh, we are at a position now where with retroactive testing, or retrospective tr- testing, rather, um, we might be looking at, at, at an argument where we could have relatively clean sport. I mean, just to throw out one figure that'll shock somebody, you know, in the 2008 Olympics, they caught, I think, seven people uh, and in and weightlifting or, or maybe the, the entire Olympics. I might be wrong. And then it was tenfold that number uh, when they retested, which is it's just a shocking statistic. So I won't, I won't spoil the pot too much, but definitely really pay attention to this one. It's a really good conversation. Emphasis on science and history with a little bit of discussion around the culture of maybe why athletes make the decision to dope. And I think we really... Really, really took this one uh, across the finish line quite well uh, with without performance enhancing drugs to help us do it. All natural, baby. Natural guys talking about enhancement. Hot guy, babes. Even if you're not interested in anabolic steroids, as you spoke of, Eric, the culture, the history of lifting, I think everyone will find something interesting with this episode. Hey, he did it. He did it. Okay, we have a participant here we have someone who just gets the iron culture who may have been on my channel already who may be the perfect person to talk about what we want to today and that is the science and history of steroids creatine for those that are unaware and also drug testing so we're joined here by alex coliari turner did i say that correct or did i butcher it no you said that correctly i'm off i'm done eric take it away yeah, Omar's retired for the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah. I'll step in while he's <laughs> drinking Mai Tais, uh, celebrating his, his ability to speak. Um, but yeah, Alex, uh, really honored to have you on. Um, we first met, I believe it was two years ago at the European Powerlifting Conference in person. That's correct, 2017. Yeah, man. And, uh, and you were a bright-eyed, young PhD student. I was a dark circles under my eyes, just finishing my PhD, burnt out husk of a man who'd finished a PhD. And uh, you looked up to me and I said, don't do it. No, that's not true. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it was really cool. You, you were, uh, you were telling me basically about doing a, like a, a PhD on real science while I basically just ran around to powerlifters and asked them to count from one to 10 uh, about how you wanted to look at the differences in prior uh, anabolic steroid users, current anabolic steroid users, and those who had never used it and the potential maybe permanent effects on, on muscle and how that could translate to performance. Um, and you have an extensive background in drug testing on the science side, which is really cool. So, um, you know, this crosses over to an interest of mine uh, of trying to understand basically the history of natural bodybuilding, um, because I really enjoy posting up historical pictures and a uh, question that often comes up, I might post a picture from somebody from 1952, and they're like, oh, my God, but uh, steroids started getting synthesized in the early 30s. That guy's got to be on gear, and, and I have to do some education so they understand uh, when something actually goes from production in a lab to you know widespread use in a community. Um, so I, I've done a fair bit of armchair research myself, but certainly not to the degree uh, you have as someone doing their PhD on this. So give us a little introduction about who you are, what you do, what your interests are, and uh, and what your PhD is about. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, so I'm a second year PhD student at the University of Brighton, which is on the south coast of England. And my research is investigating if muscle exhibits a memory of anabolic steroid exposure. And we're very much still in the recruitment phase of our research. At the moment, we have sampled over uh, 40 people, and we're still looking to recruit, um, particularly at the moment, current anabolic steroid users and past anabolic steroid users uh, to come and visit our laboratory to receive a muscle biopsy and donate blood and we can measure their muscle mass as well and for the first time uh, that's been done in the scientific literature our plan is to monitor people whilst they cycle off anabolic steroids Uh, so they visit the laboratory while they're on a cycle and then they then go off anabolic steroids And then they return six months later when they've been on cycle so we can see how much muscle mass have they lost and also at the molecular level inside their muscle, see if it has retained a memory of that previous steroid exposure. And then that's 
also why we're recruiting people who used to take anabolic steroids so we can then see if their muscle also exhibits a memory of that anabolic steroid exposure. So ideally, we're looking for people who are current users who are then going to plan on concluding a cycle. But if you're still just using anabolic steroids, but you don't come fully off, maybe you blast and cruise, or you don't want to stop taking anabolic steroids and cycle off, you can still come and be involved in this research because you're still going to better our knowledge once we do the muscle biopsy on the molecular pathways in which steroids cause muscle growth. Because for the very first time, we're going to store the muscle that we collect inside a preservant that's going to enable us to look at gene expression inside the muscle, epigenetic markers, and just in general get a better understanding of androgen receptor binding uh, that will better our knowledge on how steroids cause growth. Amazing. I just want to say a quick note before we continue the podcast, for those that do want to participate in Alex's study on our YouTube channel and also linked in our podcast description on iTunes, we'll have a link where you could send an email to Alex if you want to participate. And we highly encourage you to do so because this will further enhance everyone's knowledge. And as you said, you have right now, Alex, about 40 people, but it's kind of difficult to get individuals to come forward, right? Yes, it's it's difficult. Uh, at the moment, we've sampled 10 current users and six past users, but we have the budget and the ability to be able to do up to 15 in each of those groups. And so I'm just now trying to find as many people as possible to take advantage of the time we have for this research and the personnel, the, uh, the medical people to do the biopsies and the, uh, to make sure we can get them as many people as possible for statistical purposes. Um if anyone is interested, they can just email me. Uh, our next sample dates are going to be um, the last weekend of October in 2019. That will actually be the last possible opportunity to get involved in 2019. There will be further sample dates at the beginning of 2020, but if anybody out there is interested who is either currently using anabolic steroids, uh, just email me, or if you're a previous user of anabolic steroids, email me and I can organize a visit. Uh, we can reimburse the travel of anyone from within Europe to come to the laboratory including one night's accommodation if you require it. And that's everything that I will discuss with you. And uh, I must also say that anonymity is provided in this research. I'm the only person that knows what group you're in. And for the, the ethics of this project to be approved, I am not going to and not allowed to disclose that to anybody. And you are anonymized with random participant numbers. And so that's quite strictly enforced by the university for us to enable to do this kind of research. Um, but any research on anabolic steroids is very limited. There hasn't the last piece of research was public on past anabolic steroid users uh, was in 2006, so oh. well over a decade ago now. And so th we need to know more about what muscle looks like in people that used to take anabolic steroids. Uh, so this is now the research and the opportunity for us to do that. Um, so if anyone out there is even just slightly interested, email me to get in contact. I'll get in touch with you further, give you more details about what's required. And like equally, if you are a current user, but even if you don't plan on cycling off to be monitored through time, uh, you can still come to the laboratory because uh, with the super physiological levels of androgens, we will just gain a better understanding on the pathways of growth that have never been investigated before in terms of gene expression and epigenetic markers. Yeah, and th this really ties into uh, those who've been in the cult for a long time. Remember that we had uh, John Meadows and Mike Isertel on. Um, and, you know, one of the, the goals of Iron Culture is just to have everyone be informed, informed choice. Uh, we don't have a pro or anti position uh, with what people decide to do. Uh, we're, we're primarily here just to bring threads of lifters together. You know, obviously, I have a, I'm a natural bodybuilder myself, and that's kind of the choice I've made. But for everyone who does decide to be enhanced uh, or is wants to make that decision, I, I fully think that uh, that decision should be informed by science. And like Alex said, if it's been 13 years since the last study was published on anabolic steroids, we're, we kind of have a problem that, that as, as a community, you simply cannot be informed. And that's another thing we're going to be talking about in this podcast is just how there is this uh, kind of lay community perception around uh, what anabolic steroid drug testing effects and uh, and what you can and can't do in and out of competition and what athletes are doing versus the reality. Uh, and that's just another sign and symptom of this kind of lack of information. And that's why we brought an expert on today to talk about that and get us a little more informed. So Alex, I want to thank you for being on. I think 
for those that did not see the video or the video that Eric did on my channel going over the history of natural lifters, can you kind of take us back to the early origins of anabolic steroids, how they came about, the process where, as Eric said, for those that might just have a cursory level of knowledge, they're like, oh man, someone in the 1930s, yeah, like testosterone was first synthesized, they're enhanced. Can you just give us a breakdown of how that came to be, anabolic steroids? Uh, yes, so as you mentioned, in the early 1930s was when uh, testosterone was indeed first synthesized, specifically 1935. There were two papers published uh, from different laboratories around the world where testosterone was synthesized both in an artificial manner and another one uh, derived from cholesterol. And after the synthesis of testosterone became possible, uh, oral and injectable derivatives, specifically uh, methyl testosterone, uh, methyl testosterone and testosterone propionate became available to be used to the medical community. Um, there is some people think, and this has been largely now regarded as an urban myth, that although testosterone was synthesized in 1935, that the 1936 uh, Olympics in Germany, uh, because testosterone was synthesized there, some people think the athletes would have been using it at that time. Um, that's just speculation. And it's, uh, the same goes for German soldiers being given testosterone to increase aggressiveness in battle during World War II. There's also never been uh, any data to substantiate those claims that uh, testosterone was used in the 1936 Olympics or given to soldiers during that time time period. And the first registered clinical trial where testosterone was given to humans to try and improve hypogonadism, which is the clinical low levels of testosterone, uh, was in 1937, where they used uh, injections of testosterone propionate and methyl testosterone. And this was also incidentally the first time where testosterone was given to women and was also the first time in which uh, it was discovered that they experienced uh, masculine, masculine, they were masculinized essentially and were experienced these androgenic side effects where there was an increase in hair growth on their body. They developed a deep husky voice. And um, from that point, there was then a debate in the scientific literature about any efficacy of testosterone to be used in a therapy for women. Um, during these clinical trials, it was realized uh, that giving testosterone to men with hypogonadism would relieve their symptoms. They might end up with an increase in vigor in, and uh, and their strength might increase. And so during the early 1940s, uh, this was sort of further investigated. And this idea was confirmed in 1942 when a research paper was published where um, uh, testosterone was implanted into a, a horse that was castrated and uh, that horse still showed the physical imp uh, imp improvements in performance that you'd expect um, from a horse that was not castrated. And so that testosterone seemed to have uh, uh, fulfilled what was lacking uh, because of the castration. And Eric, I know you've mentioned this before in Omar's previous video, but there was a, a popular text around that time by Paul de Kroof, uh, that was called mm -hmm. The Male Hormone. And he uh, suggested, possibly for the first time, it, it might be interesting to see if this if this drug was given systematically to athletes to try and increase their, their performance in sport. Um, and we don't really get any reports that steroids are actually being used by athletes, even though suggested in the early 1940s until the late 1940s and the early 1950s. And that's where we start to see the reports of West Coast bodybuilders in the late 1940s and in the early 1950s starting to be experimenting with testosterone preparations. And it was at that point where testosterone preparations um, were indeed commercially available and it was viable for people to start to be using them whereas prior to that the laboratory equipment you'd have to be able to try and make that was incredibly difficult for the lay person to get a hold of and uh, it essentially was not available to the athletes that wanted to use it um, and it was from 1952 in the Olympic Games in Helsinki where the stories of steroids in sport really starts to begin uh, when you start to look to read about the history. And um, because at that point, the Soviet Union started to uh, was recovering from World War Two and they still did exceptionally well in the world in the weightlifting competition. And they managed to win seven medals, three gold, three silver and a bronze. And the U.S. Olympic weightlifting coach at the time, Bob Hoffman, uh, was quoted as saying, I know they're taking the hormone stuff to increase their strength. 
And as it turned out, he was exactly right. And two years later, at the World Weightlifting Championships in Vienna, um, where Hoffman was still the team coach, the physician of the team, Dr. John Ziegler, was told by his Soviet counterpart, um, uh, you know, sort of while they're eating and drinking at the end uh, and in the evening in one of the competitions that indeed the Soviet weightlifters were using testosterone to increase their performance. And so Ziegler returns back to the United States. He acquires testosterone and tests it on himself, on Bob Hoffman and on several other East Coast lifters coming out of York Barbell Club. And this is where Ziegler starts to specifically try to increase performance of people with testosterone and also starts to note not only the anabolic and the muscle building effects of testosterone, but also the unwanted androgenic side effects such as increased libido, hair growth, um, uh, and other detriments in health and potential prostate enlargement and things along those lines. And so Ziegler was on a quest to try and find a drug that could maybe have less side effects than testosterone, but still result in enhancement in performance. And in 1958, uh, the Ciba Pharmaceutical Company released a drug called Dianabol. And this was the first United States painted anabolic steroid. Uh, it was not intended for use by athletes. Um, it was intended to be used for people that were burn victims and were post-operative and were sedentary in bed, not doing anything and were losing muscle mass. And so to give them a drug that increased anabolism to increase the protein synthetic rate inside their muscle um, and have less side effects than testosterone was obviously beneficial. Uh, but however, Ziegler realized that this is an anabolic steroid. If we give this to athletes, it's going to increase performance. And he started to administer it to members inside the York Barbell Club. And unsurprisingly, they obviously experienced a big increase in performance. And uh, that is really the moment where it's regarded that even it's been quoted by um, Chuck Yeselis. He's a professor of sports science at Penn State, where he really says that was the moment where, and this is a quote from him, where the genie was out of the bottle because it was sort of realized that um, this is a performance enhancing drug that can be used, even though it's not intended to be used as a performance enhancing drug. And this was a very, very different time in terms of the legality of anabolic steroid in the United States. This was a point where as a physician, you could prescribe anabolic steroids to an athlete, um, even though they're not a burn victim, as a physicians could still write a prescription for that athlete. That, uh, that athlete would then just go to a pharmacy and they would be able to pay and get pharmaceutical grade anabolic steroids. Um, that was that was not illegal. That was not breaking the law. And that was even at the time, not even breaking any drug testing rulings, because even at that time point, there was not even any drugs at all that were banned in sport. So this was all perfectly above board in terms of drug testing and legality in the country. And Ziegler around that time was prescribing around 10 milligrams a day to his athletes, which is much less than the dosages that you'll hear people using now. Uh, but this was pivotal was that um, – Ziegler was prescribing it to many different people at York Barbell Club. But what seemed to then happen was uh, many of these lifters became strength and conditioning coaches that spread around the country. They went into the collegiate system for football and the collegiate system for athletics. And ultimately, they took um, the secret that Anna Dianabol and physicians writing prescriptions for anabolic steroids was one way that they could increase uh, their, their performance. And it's interesting that uh, Ziegler, he was interviewed close towards his death, and uh, he has said that he actually uh, regrets prescribing uh, anabolic steroids to athletes um, because at the time he was prescribing very low dosages, the athlete's health were being monitored, and the idea was to only be used by people who are in elite competition, whereas... 20 years later, anabolic steroids would spread to use being used by high school children. And that's something Ziegler never intended and never wanted. And he never wanted this mass spread of these drugs in sport. And he ends up saying, and his direct quotes are, um, uh, what a terrible price these young children are going to pay if only I'd known it'd come to this. And if I'd look, if I, if I could go back, I'd, I'd erase that whole chapter of my life. And wow. so he really was... Uh, I mean, Ziegler prescribing the steroids to York barbell lifters that then went out to became coaches at, at collegiate level and spread around the country was really the, the beginning of the spread of anabolic steroids in sport. 
uh, moving away from just Olympic weightlifting at the Olympic level to then spreading out towards all sports at all levels. Um, and just a couple of years later, by 1960, it seems that uh, anabolic steroids um they were starting to spread that was still really mainly only being used by strength athletes. So still was kind of focused around Olympic weightlifting. It hadn't spread out fully yet, but other, other drugs had started to spread to other sports, um, particularly at this time, amphetamines were being used by mm -hmm. cyclists. And in the 1960 Olympic Games in Rome, which incidentally was the very first Olympic Games to be televised, um, uh, uh, tragically, a, a Danish cyclist, uh, uh, Enmark Janssen, nerd Enmark Janssen, uh, died and collapsed and it was believed that he was taking a cocktail of vasodilating drugs uh, amphetamine stimulants and that in combination with the summer heat of italy resulted in heat stroke that that confounded the, that cocktail and he ended up passing away and an olympian dying live on television was um, a catastrophe for the international olympic committee this is obviously not something they want as what is regarded as the ultimate celebration of athletics um And so they then the following year uh, founded a medical committee in 1961 that decided to have the purpose of trying to uh, combat this this issue of, of, of doping in sports. Um, and so by the time we then move from the 1960 Olympics to the 1964 Olympics, um, the drugs in sport issue and anabolics spread and it's now no longer being used by just by Olympic weightlifters and it's being by used by um, other Uh, other sports and incidentally we have to talk about the invention of another anabolic steroid that would be pivotal in athletics and that would be in 1965 uh, uh, oral turinabol being synthesized mm. by Genefar which was a state-owned pharmaceutical company uh, based in the German Democratic Republic at the time and in 1966 uh, was when we have now discovered um, when the records uh, became available to clarify that, that, that that's East Germany correct That's East Germany. Yeah, that's right. So that's and behind the Iron a, Curtain. That's part uh, of the, the USSR the at the time. Yep. Yeah, and was a communist country. And uh, they instigated the, as far as we know, the biggest state-sponsored doping program uh, of, of, of that era in which up to 10,000 athletes, some of them females that were 10 years old, were being given anabolic steroids. And um, unknowingly, And this was because uh, the whole system of that country was controlled. And if you were viewed as a talented athlete, as a young child, you were put inside special schooling, school systems where you were trained to then try to become an Olympic champion. And as they viewed that culturally as showing their dominance on the in international stage in terms of sport, Uh, especially because they were a small country. If we could win a lot of Olympic medals, this would show our strength as a country. Um, but what was going on was that uh, the over 10,000 athletes over a 20 year period, starting in 1966 up until the eighties um, physicians were giving anabolic steroids to the, the athletes. Um, in many cases, the athletes had no idea. They were told that the pills they were given were vitamins Uh, and they were there to um, help with mineral and vitamin deficiencies that were occurring from living in a country like that, where maybe the diet wasn't the best. And they were also giving them in, uh, injections of steroids and at the same time were telling them that that was vitamin injections. Um, and it's now come out after the Iron Curtain fell down and now – Uh, many of those doctors that were involved in that have indeed been uh, given prison sentences, fines, and um, a lot of the people that are still alive today from that have been given uh, compensation from what from what occurred. Um, so it's one of the big, big sort of tragic stories of uh, of that time. Um, and yeah. indeed, those athletes really did and really were successful for a country of that size. They won a lot more gold medals than you'd expect. Um, and they were indeed particularly successful. And they also were very clever with evading the drug testing, uh, that once it comes invented later in this timeline, I'll, I'll note some of the ways that the East German scientists were screening their athletes prior to competition for the next 20 years or so to guarantee they could still get to international competitions and test clean, but still, wow. Again, at this time, we have to say in the late 1960s, again, anabolic steroids are spreading now. They're being used by not just strength athletes, but by track and field. And there is still no drug testing, uh, still um, 
there is no indeed uh, uh, prohibited list for drugs. Um, that that doesn't happen until 1967. Um, in, in 1967, uh, there is another another tragic death of someone called uh, Tommy Simpson. He was a British Tour de France cyclist. He dies an an amphetamine related death on the slopes of the of the Tour de France on on the on the mountains, and. In 1967, the International Medical Committee decides to ban uh, drugs, certain drugs at that time point. And they actually fail to ban anabolic steroids and testosterone at this point. They're banning things like amphetamines, as that's what's causing people to die on the spot in the middle of competitions. But um, still, in the late 1960s, uh, anabolic steroids are not really that well known by the authorities. And probably more telling of a reason why they didn't put them on the prohibited list was there was no drug test for them. And so in the late 1960s, even though the, the International Olympic Committee is starting to declare you should not be taking drugs and coming to compete at the Olympics, there's still no drug test for anabolic steroids. And another big issue at this time as well was that the medical community didn't even believe anabolic steroids were performance enhancing and could build muscle, which obviously sounds ridiculous, um, but that's the prevailing medical opinion of the time, and so much as that in 1977, the American College of Sports Medicine, uh, in a position paper, uh, publishes uh, the fact that they have found no conclusive evidence that anabolic steroids aid athletic performance, which is obviously sounds totally ridiculous, but a lot of the studies that were being conducted at that time, they were underdosing the steroids they were giving to the participants. There was no control group. Uh, they weren't controlling the training or the diet or, 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 the, or the lifestyle of the people that were being given anabolic steroids in these in these in these studies, or they weren't, uh, no, and also not being placebo controlled is a, another major issue. And so it seems that the methodology of a lot of the administration studies that was going on in the 1960s and 70s were not coming up with conclusive evidence that anabolic steroids are performance enhancing. Uh, hence, why the American College of Sports Medicine concludes there is no conclusive evidence that they are. And it wasn't until a, a decade later that they changed their mind. And in 1987, you know, they retracted their opinion. Yeah, so they retracted their opinion in 87. This just goes to show you how long it takes for uh, some of this stuff to be understood because um, it was so novel at the time. And I think just for all the listeners who are uh, or, or watchers who are seeing us on the Internet, um, it's just really important to understand what the world was like in a pre-Internet phase. Um, you know, you were, you were talking about the medical community being behind, but even the bodybuilding community was behind itself. So, uh, you, you mentioned, uh, Diana Ball getting released in 1958, uh, Nilovar, another, uh, uh, synthetic anabolic, uh, oral, oral steroid came out in 56 and the, uh, the patent through, uh, I think the, uh, FDA came out in the early fifties for longer lasting, longer lasting, um, testosterone variations that, that could stay in your system longer than test test prop. And uh, so, yeah, like, although there were some of these bodybuilders like York Barbell experimenting with injectable testosterone in the early 50s and then uh, people using uh, Dianabol when it came out in 58, the, the so-called uh, father of natural bodybuilding, Chet Yorton, who the Yorton Cup is named after, he didn't become aware of uh, the fact that bodybuilders were using anabolic steroids until the 60s. Uh, and that's when he was like, oh, I'm, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, we need to make sure that we have a place for people who don't want to use it. And they were, you know, it, it wasn't a ubiquitous thing in the bodybuilding community at this time yet. It was something that certain level, high level champions had used, um, you know, like Bill Pearl talks about in the late 50s, like 58, uh, you know, he, he, had, he had played around with Nilovar and then uh, Diana Ball briefly and that he'd been exposed to it. So it's the kind of thing where, um, there was almost a 10 year lag before it became popular knowledge, even within the bodybuilding community. Um, so to expect, and if you think about it, like how, how would information travel from New York to Chicago, to, to California, to Texas, et cetera, uh, to the UK, you know, across Europe where, where it probably started earlier. I think we just need to put it in perspective that, um, we didn't even have transatlantic phone calls during some of this era, let alone the internet. So, um, you know, and also like if a paper gets published in, in, in German uh, or, or Swiss um, about 
anabolic steroids, you know, how, how does that get translated? You don't just hit the translate button on, on Instagram to, to get that your influencer posted a picture about the study. You know, that's not a thing. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it, that's a helpful cultural or historical background so everyone understands why this was a very slow kind of percolating thing in this field. One thing I just want to dovetail off of, Eric, and I want your opinion, both of you guys, your opinion on it is just the cultural attitudes towards anabolics. We have Ziegler, uh, who basically pulled the Oppenheimer, where he regretted, you know, Oppenheimer regretted the atomic bomb, he uh, regretted introducing anabolic steroids. He didn't quite say, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, but he said something similar in terms of uh, you know creating... <laughs> anabolic steroids or, or uh, giving it to individuals. But as you noted, Alex, you said that in uh, East Germany, they were given to children, they were given to people, they were told they're essentially vitamins. And it's just such a mind blown concept. We had Mike Isretel who was talking about cultural attitudes in parts of Europe, where to me, it's kind of reminiscent in ways of smoking back in the 30s and 40s, where you'd have occasionally doctors talking about it or just the way that they would frame it. If you have it state sponsored and you have these scientists telling you that these things are good for you, and then you start taking them as opposed to, as Eric said, the Jordan Cup or, or uh, Chet Jordan, where he immediately mm -hmm. in the 60s, he made a stance and there's a different attitude, how that informs choice w in terms of what you think about these things. And so I think that's an interesting conversation as that begins to grow, because you even see, I'm thinking of comic books now with Captain America. It's like, what? How did Captain America become Captain America? He basically took steroids. But then we start hearing, you know, over here Permanent. in the West, the eat the Permanent the steroids. Yeah. One one time shot. Yeah. yeah. So I think a brief the uh, longest acting <laughs> Esther ever. <laughs> yeah. it is, it's it's permanent, bro. Um so mm -hmm. I'm just interested in uh, your guys quickly before we continue. Around this time, we're talking 60s, 70s, you're talking now, Europe, Alex, Eric, you said a little bit about America. Just cultural attitudes when it comes to anabolic steroids. I'll, I'll chime in briefly here because I have um, the unique experience of having traveled around and, and engaged with a lot of different sports science schools and sometimes getting to talk to professors who've been around since the uh, since this era, who are in their 60s and 70s now. Um, and then, you know, like like you and I got to talk to uh, Mike Isretel, who comes from Russia and, and speaks Russian and is very familiar with that system. And um, I also know some Russian Olympic weightlifters and folks who've come from there and moved to New Zealand and, and, and things like that. So the the cultural attitudes are very different and we'll talk about this later in the podcast uh, the quality of drug testing and the pervasiveness of use of peds is very different country to country we often kind of just talk about like elite athletes but a elite athlete in in the uk or the us or or eastern europe uh, or south america all are going to have very different pressures and uh, quality of testing but anyway I think it's really interesting when we look at these um, top-down totalitarian states versus a republic or a democracy and the way that influences things. And there's pros and cons there. So, for example, I guarantee you there is stacks and stacks and stacks of literature uh, on on the, the studied effects of anabolics and performance-enhancing drugs on athletes that, that hasn't reached the light of day that came out of the USSR. Uh, and it's sports scientists were were studying this. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, you, there, there's some of them have come out, and you can see um, where they inst inst they tried to destroy it, a lot of these records um, before the Iron Curtain fell down. But because uh, they're all very efficient Germans, uh, they actually had multiple copies in different locations, and some survived. And from that, we can then see specific instances where they've given certain dosages to athletes and then even tracked their javelin throw their discus throw their shot put throw after giving a certain amount uh, for specific times and you can even see the line the, the linearity of the graph and their their performance just going up and up um, and similarly there's also massive reports of how much was too much and at what point the side effects became too much um there's reports um, where male weightlifters had to have gynecomastia um, surgically removed um, uh, 
by physicians in the East German in the in the GDR um, because the it was becoming too problematic. And there's also reports where women were experiencing such bad side effects that um, they were experiencing hair growth all over their body and were having to go to the doctors and trying to wondering why was this happening to them. And so the athletes did start to sort of coin on because some of these bizarre side effects that they weren't being given vitamins. But there's reports of how if the if they were found to be talking about this or re- declining to be given the drugs they'd be kicked off the program and that in that country meant you were not given you were kicked off being looked after you were provided with food accommodation and you were eliminated from 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 the program and so they had to keep going on and if they didn't they had to go and find a life elsewhere um so they had no choice, uh, essentially, uh, to to keep to keep to keep uh, continuing on the life that they were known to be living. Mm, yeah. So, so the, and, and that's just East Germany. You know, there there was a, a, a broad USSR at that time, and um, yeah, and uh, and obviously the USSR changed over time. You know, closer to the time when uh, the USSR actually collapsed, there was it was a little less of a totalitarian controlled state um and then obviously you know russia and individual countries emerged from it and there has still been reports of uh, organized doping in some of these eastern european countries and um you might as tell shared with us the kind of the cultural perception of of athletes in in europe is that using lesser dosages uh, and it's something you only do once you get to an elite level and it's administered by a doctor and you're monitored um, that might be the more modern era of, of some of these Eastern European countries versus kind of when it was the Wild West at the start. Um, but they're always shocked by some of the stories they hear from the U.S., which is an interesting perspective now. Uh, and it makes a little more sense because in the, in the U.S. and in the countries where um, kind of we have this rugged individualist aspect, it's going to be individuals or individual gyms or individual teams who are going out and doing this and then doing it without the the assistance of a doctor or or any kind of state sponsored program uh, not informed by research etc so yeah there's 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 a lot of pros and cons and a lot of different cultural context and background I think sometimes we'll either just go yeah yeah the Russians are on tons of shit and they take it all the time and they start <laughs> when they're five and that might be informed <laughs> by what happened you know in uh, during during the era that we're talking about here um, but that's actually probably not accurate uh, in, in modern times, at least. And it may be something that's a lot more more controlled and conservative and, and doctor supervised compared to, um, you know, some bodybuilder in Los Angeles uh, getting veterinarian grade drugs from a dude in an alley uh, that may or may not even be what he thinks he's buying. And the same guy is going to then offer him, hey, would you want a two for one deal for cocaine? And he's like, oh, <laughs> n- n- no, thanks. That's not what I'm here for. Yeah. You know, so I think I think that that's important to realize, too. Um, so that that would be my only commentary on your question, Omar. Well, all I was going to say, Eric, we're basically talking about the merits of individualism versus collectivism. And you basically just gave the winning argument for individualism, which is cocaine. You could get it alongside your steroids. So if that was the takeaway, coach, I got you. Yeah, if you want the two for one deal <laughs> on on fake anabolic steroids or different anabolic steroids than you think and, and cocaine that is... <laughs> probably cut with something that might kill you <laughs> that's the way to go baby freedom USA. coke <laughs> yep because actually i've given really two two really good options you know <laughs> yeah. uh either that one we just had or being given anabolic steroids at the age of 10 uh, and being told it's vitamins <laughs> and uh, if you don't get to do it then you uh get to lose your livelihood and the love of your sport so mm. it's a beautiful wide world we live in <laughs> you're saying alex uh, so uh, we are we're now towards the end of the 1960s, and uh, anabolic steroids, and they're now spreading um, to various other sports. So much so in the 1968 uh, Olympic Games, um, there is a, a member who was on the U.S. track and field team, and they have a training camp at Lake Tahoe. We're going up to the Mexico Olympics in 1968, and he estimated that one third of the entirety of the U.S. track and field team was using steroids at the pre-training camp. Um, again, 
They're not banned. Uh, there's no drug test for anabolic steroids in the 1968 Olympics. There's no drug test for testosterone. They're not on the prohibited list. There's, 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 and they're still legal in America to buy and and to get from a physician's prescription. So they're not breaking any rules. Um, in 1968, the, the editor of the Track and Field News magazine, uh, John Hendershot, um, was cited in the magazine as saying that these drugs were, and the quote is, the breakfast of champions, and. Um, it it was becoming more and more uh, realized that athletes are starting to take anabolic steroids. In the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, uh, Jay Sylvester, who has now become a researcher at Brigham Young University, he unofficially polled all of the track and field contestants across all countries in Munich, and 68% of them admitted that they were taking anabolic steroids in the run-up to the Olympic Games in 1972 in Munich. And so... At this time point, it sort of becomes realized these are being used in sport. We now need to try and have a new drug test for them. And in 1973, the drug test is invented for the oral anabolic steroids only. And it was first implemented as a trial in the 1974 Commonwealth Games in Auckland in New Zealand. And only nine out of 55 samples test positive for androgens. Um, but it must be noted that the sophistication of the test in 1973 was not great. And uh, in the anti-doping literature, particularly someone called Andrew Kickman, he's a researcher at King's College London. Uh, he's got a, a review paper on the pharmacology of anabolic steroids. It's published in 2008. And he notes in that uh, piece of literature that the detection window was at best weeks so you could very much um, stop an anabolic steroid oral cycle three weeks out from the competition and not test positive. Um, as the news is starting to spread that oral anabolic steroids are started to be tested, um, the athletes start to realize that maybe they don't want to hedge their bets and start to use those drugs. So maybe they can actually start just using test injectable testosterone itself, which at this time there was no drug test and it was not banned. And so – uh, the Olympic Games in Montreal in 1976, uh, drug testing is conducted for oral anabolic steroids. Uh, only eight out of 275 people test positive. However, um, there is no drug, there is no drug test for testosterone at this time. And the research community starts to think that the athletes are just transitioning from oral anabolic steroids to using testosterone. So in the off season, you'd use oral anabolic steroids. You'd go into the competition. They would have cleared your system. If the drug detection window is only a matter of weeks, you could then transition to using testosterone up to and on the days of competition. And because there's no drug test, you would not test positive. Um, and so, a so just a brief note on pharmacology, just so people are understanding. Uh -huh. um, so they're taking oral synthetic steroids, which are probably easier to detect because they don't look the same uh, chemically as actual injectable testosterone that has been just modified to, to hang around in your system longer, like a testosterone anethate or something like that. That's uh, exactly you just clarify it. that for the, for the listeners so they know the difference between oral anabolic steroid and injectable testosterone? Uh, that's right. So the oral anabolic steroids that we're talking about here, so Dianabol, Terinabol, Winstrol, uh, and the such are uh, derivatives of testosterone or dihydrotestosterone and modifications on testosterone so that it can be orally active, whereas testosterone itself is not orally active. Um, and these modifications enable the drugs to be taken orally. Um, but because they are synthetic, they are broken down to cause create metabolites that are unique to that drug. So you're only going to have a dianabol or a terinabol metabolite in your urine because you've ingested um, that drug. And so it's easy to detect. You're just looking for the metabolite in the urine. And at this time, the, the time at which that metabolite was present in your urine after stopping taking the drug was probably one to two to three weeks. Um, so you could transition to using injectable testosterone which looks exactly like the testosterone that's present in your blood anyway. And at that time, there was no test to distinguish the artificial testosterone that you were injecting to the normal testosterone your body was making. So it was a very easy way to you still use a substance that was anabolic and going to give you performance-enhancing effects, but was not creating any diagnostic unique metabolites in the urine that could be easily detected, such as those orals. And... Um, it was realized that this is probably what the athletes were doing because this was the way that you could quite easily cheat the test uh, as there was no way to try and catch this exogenous use of, of testosterone. 
uh, and so a researcher. An inter interesting historical note on, oh, yeah. on the fact that uh, that the testosterone is not orally. Well, basically, the half life is so short that it might as well not work if taken orally. Uh, just you know, it, and then why why synthetic versions were were formed is so. Some of the you mentioned earlier how there was uh, whispers of West Coast bodybuilders in the late forties taking this stuff. Uh, the the root of that rumor is probably a company that got shut down by the FDA in the late 40s, early 50s. I might have my, my ears a little bit off by a year or two, who was advertising uh, crystalline uh, testosterone tablets as, as a supplement. And um, it was thought that these were actually just testosterone tablets. So people were buying these and they wouldn't be orally active. Uh, and they got shut down by the FDA because <clears throat> testosterone had, had, had not been approved yet. Um, so just an interesting little, little, little tidbit of how everything kind of goes through that same cycle. Like we see today, supplements come out too early. They don't work. It's some form that doesn't, it's not effective. Uh, or people will, will try to jump on the bandwagon of pro hormones or pro steroids or SARMs. And you find out that it either wasn't what it was. It, it was ineffective, potentially harmful, and you probably wasted your money. And that even happened in the, uh, the West coast scene um in, in the magazines back in the late in the late 40s with uh with oral testosterone that you couldn't do anything with so anyway interesting little note just no. as an aside it, yeah the oral testosterone as in its pure form would just get degraded in first pass metabolism of the liver into inactive metabolites and it wouldn't do anything so it wouldn't have worked at all and that's why um these uh, te these ester groups had to be attached to testosterone, which were then once injected get cleaved off to then leave uh, free testosterone in the bloodstream at a very basic level. Um, yeah. So the athletes, there were as we problems were saying, with that stuff too. So sorry, oh, one, yeah, one more yeah, fun, yeah, fun, yeah. fun, <laughs> fun, fun historical note. So the oh, um, so methyl testosterone, which was was something that they were taking orally, and then injectable tes testosterone propionate was basically what was around in the earliest eras. And uh, the reports of side effects of methyl testosterone were pretty high. And you may recall when M M1 test came out as a quote unquote uh, pro hormone, which is basically methyl 1 testosterone that came out back in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s in the first era of the pro hormone craze. And I remember a lot of people experiencing side effects from taking that and they reported on like the forums. So anyway, um, and then test prop, I think. Man, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong here, Alex, but I think it's only going to be active in your system for like a day um, before you yeah, then have people, to get another people, injection. People would inject that every other day or every day, yeah. So what yeah, were some so, of the side effects, Eric, when you said there's massive side effects? Like out of curiosity, what were people reporting? So a lot of androgenic side effects. So um, and, and then, of course, this has got to go through the liver, so there's potentially some, some side effects there. Yeah. It's liver toxic, so, yeah. Yeah, so liver toxicity and then and then being pretty pretty and, and androgenizing, I guess you, you'd call it. Uh, but liver toxicity was the big issue that, that you saw get reported in the medical trial. So they didn't want to give people methyl one test orally, even though they could, uh, and they were not enjoying uh, the the cost of injecting people every day with test test proper every other day to deal with hypo hypogonadism. And you, you might have heard Alex say uh, with that uh, castrated horse, the implanted testosterone. Uh, some of the most common uh, therapies they would do to deal with hypogonadism in, in the clinical setting was actually pellets that they would implant subdermally and it would slowly be, be introduced into the system so they could get around the whole uh, daily injection thing. So um, you, you'd get a form of, of testosterone implanted as a pellet to get this kind of slow release, which was why there was such a push to develop long-lasting esters and, these, and also these... Um, uh, the orally bioavailable uh, versions like Nilovar and Dianabol and oral Turinabol that came out later. So the just to something so people know that not only was information really hard to get around about how to use this, what to do about it, and it was kind of segregated in the medical community and then used a little bit experimentally in the lifting community, um, but the logistics were really difficult until you started to see the, the orally available um, things like D-ball come out. And that's really when... Uh, there's some uh, people who are historians who speculate that truly the first use of uh, widespread sophisticated anabolics in the weightlifting community, for the most part, uh, that wasn't in Russia where they had, uh, you know, kind of the doctor supervised um, administration, at least in the U.S. and the bodybuilding community, was the late 50s. 
uh, because that's when D-Ball came out and, and people were able to simply go, right, read the label, go to the pharmacist, take this FDA approved drug. And it, and it actually was something that they knew what they were doing. Man, we need to forget all this synthetic shit and just mother nature provides, you know, Eric, I'm a, I'm a naturalist. Um, and I'm sure Alex would agree with this, that you're talking about all these terrible side effects, but we've known for a long time that bull testicles, just raw, Mm -hmm. you don't, you don't cook it. You know what I'm saying? You just get all (laughs) up in there. Uh, anabolic is hell and they don't want you to know about it. They, the scientists, so whatever it's, it's all correct. Just, just eat, eat nuts and you're good to go. Get some. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm-hmm. You'd, you'd have to be careful though because if that cow was given trembolone then you might then test positive for trembolone which would be uh quite the embarrassing story better. to sell <laughs> yeah you get no performance enhancing effect but you fail the drug test it's perfect yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah all right so back back to our timeline alex anything i said there that you're like oh you're wrong you're an idiot no 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 that's that's definitely true and uh the testosterone, propionate testosterone and naphthate was where people could then start to really use injectable testosterone. And in the by the time of the late 1960s, that was going to be the drug of choice because it was undetectable. Um, because uh, there, was, there was no way essentially of distinguishing between the synthetic testosterone and your normal testosterone. And so you could have super physiological levels. You could be benefiting from the anabolism of the drug, but there was no way of detecting it. And the researchers were believing this is what's happening. And the athletes are just transitioning from the oral drugs that create these diagnostic metabolites in the urine that we can detect to injectable testosterone, which currently we can't distinguish between no, uh, in uh, endogenous and your own production of testosterone. And the research that came up in 1980 with a test for, te- for testosterone, uh, Professor Manfred uh, Donaik, um, he actually screened all of the urine samples that were c- collected uh, at the 1980 Olympic Games. And he found that 20% of the athletes all of in, in total, including male and female athletes, would, would have failed his new testosterone test. And 20, wow. that also that twenty percent also included sixteen gold medalists. So that proved to the IOC when uh, this professor said athletes are just transitioning from the orals to the injectable testosterone. We need to use my my drug test. And so from that point onwards, uh, he managed to convince the IOC. And from nineteen eighty two injectable testosterone uh, then had a test and the test for injectable testosterone is quite easy to conceptualize essentially uh, your body naturally in your urine is uh, testosterone is getting placed in there to remove it from your body um there's a close uh, chemical that's very similar to testosterone called epitestosterone and in a normal human they should be getting excreted in around a one-to-one ratio but if you inject synthetic testosterone, the amount of testosterone excreted in your urine goes up, whereas the amount of epitestosterone you're excreting stays the same. And mm. that one-to-one ratio is normal in most people. Um, I won't talk about the people that are genetic abnormalities for bravatine to, to make it easy. But in most instances, people are excreting it around one-to-one. And if you inject the testosterone, the amount you put in your urine goes up. And the epitestosterone stays the same. And the cutoff that Don Ike originally proposed was six to one. So if your testosterone was uh, six times higher than it was supposed to be uh, compared to the epitestosterone, then there's, that's not physiologically possible. Um, that's too high to even be a genetic and abnormality. The amount of testosterone in your urine is only therefore coming from injections. And in people that got, get caught taking testosterone, their, t- their testosterone to epitestosterone ratio is not seven or eight to one it can be hundreds to one so it's right. very obvious that that's that's not come from a genetic abnormality the six to one was to try to put, put a cutoff where at the population level uh, it's unlikely you could naturally be producing six to one testosterone to epi testosterone there are some people that do that naturally but in the vast majority of cases that's not not what's occurring and if you're going above that it's highly likely you were taking exogenous testosterone um and so they believe they've they've improved drug testing now. So the athletes were transitioning from the orals to the injectables. We know they were using injectable testosterone in the 1980 games from this this testing that Don Ike performed, uh, and up to 20% of the athletes, including 16 gold medalists, were doing that. Um, and so he is that a conservative estimate, Alex? 
because that's that, that that's, was that's that, something that's from the urine they collected at that time point and and also that's with the six to one cutoff where mm-hmm. people if they stopped the injections a little bit further out they might have dipped below that and at this time point the six to one cutoff was the only uh, way to prove exogenous testosterone where so that's not what happens now now uh even if your urine is uh, now, nowadays it's actually a four to one cutoff and if your urine goes above that um you're subjected to a test that can distinguish between synthetic and natural testosterone inside your urine with mass spectrometry and carbon isotope ratios. That was not available to the scientists at the time. And so the only mark proxy they had was the six to one ratio. So if you stopped your testosterone enough at the time of the way out, your number could dip down and you could be under the cutoff. And there was then still, even though you had a bit of artificial testosterone in your urine, there was still no way to distinguish it and you would have tested clean. Whereas now... They will monitor athletes' testosterone levels in their urine through time and how it fluctuates. And so, if mm. your T to E ratio is even say uh, is fluctuating from say three to one down to one to one, back up to three to one, or it's even less than that in in in, if, in some instances. Um, if the statistical variation is outside of what you'd expect someone to normally vary in terms of their testosterone production in their urine, even if they're not going above the four to one cutoff, they still now will conduct the isotope ratio test to look if that testosterone in your urine is synthetic. And in some Mm. instances, it has been proven to be indeed be synthetic. And those athletes are then very clever with when they're cutting their, stopping their testosterone cycles because they're going below the four to one cutoff. But because there's such a back catalogue of their previous T to E ratios, the fluctuation is too much. That something funny must be going on. And then they can indeed prove the synthetic testosterone is in their urine. Whereas at this time, it was just the number cutoff. If you were above six to one, that's it. You tested positive. If you're below six to one, there's no way you were taking testosterone. It's not possible for you to to be doing that. Whereas you, you could have just stopped a certain time of the way before and go into the competition. Now, if people do that, because if they have previous data on their testosterone levels, if it fluctuates too much, even if it's below the four to one cutoff, the test can still be conducted to look for the synthetic nature of that testosterone in their urine. But that wasn't available at that time. Um, Mm -hmm. Still, drugs in sport is is now becoming a pretty major issue in in, in America. Uh, As we start to transition into the 1980s, um, there was a book published by Dr. Robert Kerr. He was a physician in San Gabriel in California. His book was called The Practical Use of Anabolic Steroids with Athletes. And he was one of the few physicians at the time that was very open about the fact he prescribed steroids to athletes. Uh, Again, they were not meant for athletes. They were supposed to be used for people who were suffering from clinical muscle wastage diseases, but still a physician could write a prescription for an athlete. And he's admitted to prescribing steroids to over 10,000 athletes out of just one clinic. And um, he had also uh, admitted that he had prescribed steroids to athletes who won medals in the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. And his opinion on the matter was it wasn't cheating because at that time, everyone else was indeed doing it. Um, So you can see that it was becoming more common now uh, that many athletes among many sports, it's at this point where it starts to come out that in just the major sports in America, anabolic steroids are starting to be used in uh, the the NFL, the MLB, the NBA, the NHL. And that starts to really get leaked out uh, after this testosterone test becomes invented because the testosterone test is uh, approved in 1982. In 1983, it's the Pan American Games in Venezuela. And uh, they use this testosterone test for the very first time. And they catch 15 people uh, doing it, 11 weightlifters, a cyclist, a fencer, a sprinter, and a shot putter. So a whole wide variety of sports. And... Because they announced that this new testosterone test exists and they were going to be conducting it, uh, 12 American athletes just leave the <laughs> leave, leave the venue and they, and they go back to America. And that that in itself um, was uh, shocking for the the press at the time and the media. And they then decided to investigate um, – uh, anabolic steroid usage in in professional sports in America and at the collegiate level and they start to discover that indeed 
uh, anabolic steroids are being used in the NFL, the MLB, the NBA and the NHL. And at that time, no drug testing was being conducted at any of those organizations. And uh, there was nothing to be to be done about stopping athletes using steroids. And again, physicians could just prescribe them for athletes at the time. And there's some estimates that and some people uh, believe that between 50 and 75 percent of offensive and defensive linemen in the NFL in this early 1980s period were potentially using anabolic steroids. But obviously, we're never going to know the exact prevalency. But uh, along with what Dr. Robert Kerr was saying and the clientele that was visiting his clinic and that he was open enough to say he was prescribing it for, we know that the professional sports in America were indeed using steroids at that time and they were doing no drug testing because they weren't Olympic sports. Um, mm-hmm. and this, this is a really uh, interesting era to me because in the 80s, that's when... Uh, there had been enough time and enough sophistication and it was legal that people pretty much knew what they were doing with the drugs, in my estimation, if I had to guess. And it was incredibly yeah. widespread. You know, you could talk about it. There wasn't the same kind of cultural taboo. Um, yeah, and, and, and Eric, it'd be, it'd be worth mentioning that uh, in 1981, the underground steroid handbook came out by Dan Duchesne, which yep. is by many people regarded as one of the very first sort of self-help guides on how somebody can use anabolic steroids for performance enhancement, particularly in bodybuilding, powerlifting and the strength sports. And as you said, at that point, uh, anabolic steroids had spilled out from just being something that uh, Olympians were using. 15 years ago to now spreading into the gyms in America that uh, and recreational gym goers were now using. Whereas previously 20 years ago, it was very unlikely uh, that level of, of athlete was using anabolic steroids. Whereas mm-hmm. now still with the legality in the country, you could just find the doctor that was willing to prescribe them to you that you could get the prescription and then go and, uh, and, and buy them. Um, yeah. the, the, towards the late 1980s, the law did kind of change a little bit where, for example, in California, it was illegal to prescribe steroids and uh, just for athletic performance. But slightly before that, in where, especially in 1981, the Dan Duchesne's Underground Steroid Handbook comes out. Um, uh, it, it starts to spread outside of the professional sports and more into uh, into mainstream culture. Yeah. Uh, well said, and, and the um, one thing you'll you'll often hear uh, on, on online these days, one of those things that I think people don't think through fully, is they they think about how athletic performance has improved uh, throughout time. You know, we, we get faster the hundred meters, the, uh, the the lifts keep going up in powerlifting and weightlifting, and I hear some very, uh, I would say, negative kind of opinions that oh, it's all because of drugs. And one thing I like to remind people is that while people are beating the tests and people are attempting, there, there's this constant war between drug testers and drug uh, users, um, that the difference between the 80s, the, 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 the 80s until the legality actually changed, and now is that you have to try to beat the test. Back then, you could take everything, all of everything, as much as you want, almost all the way up to competition. And now... Like people act as though because um, the sophistication of beating the tests has improved that the actual efficacy or dosages. But most of the time, what what we're talking about is people are taking lower dosages of drugs that have been engineered not to be more effective, but to be undetectable. And the amount and the consistency which people are taking it after the 80s has actually gone down. So um, I think that's just something people to realize when they ascribe all world records and all Olympic performances to advances in drug use, that uh, most of the advances have not been in the efficacy of drugs, but in their detectability uh, and, and things like that. So anyway, just, just an interesting aside to, to think about what the average shot putter was doing in 1981 versus 2019. It's probably a whole boatload more drugs back then. Uh, in, in comparison, I do have a one. I'm very, one yeah, yeah, that's definitely true. I was, I was going to say I have a one quick question, um, Alex, and also for you, Eric, and that would be around this time, the '80s. I'm thinking of the figure of Carl Lewis. I'm thinking of Ben Johnson later on, then uh, sprinters, top level athletes. Where you know, Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, cool. It's state sponsored. We see things now like Icarus, the documentary. For these athletes that are high level, so not just the sports athletes, but also the Olympic athletes, there's been no 
direct link ever of the government being complicit right it's it's i guess it's coaches always approaching athletes when when we find out about an, the anabolic use of someone like carl Lewis, you know who was first in denial he's he was the guy to uh talk a little shit about ben johnson being pop saying you know, i'm clean like what a shame then he did and we never get to the truth of where it came from because they'll say like oh, i don't know it's in a supplement that i took what is the most likely explanation for, let's say, Western athletes then they use? And you gave that statistic of them uh, getting caught. Would it be coach approaches athlete? Uh, you know, there's been no, as far as I'm aware, and you guys can correct me, direct evidence of the government being complicit. So it's always the coach approaching the athlete. How does it work? Because the prevalence is very high. I'm just wondering how it gets introduced we know in uh, the East, we know in Russia, uh, state-sponsored. So what would be, how does it work over here? So there's a, a cool paper that came out of Australia a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's a very similar kind of Western country to the U.S. and Canada um, about people who have either been caught and then been willing to be interviewed or who have admitted and, and then anonymously included in a study to purposely violating uh, the, the doping protocols in, in their sport. Yep. And then what are their motivations? Why has it happened and, and, and in what context? Um, and they had some bodybuilders in there because um, um, in, in Australia, ASADA, A-S-A-D-A, which is like USADA, USADA, it's the same uh, WADA approved internal testing organization, uh, actually sanctions the, the natural bodybuilding feds there, which is kind of interesting, which is not all happens in some countries, but not all. A lot of them do their own internal federation specific testing, which is why you see like polygraph in, in, in some of the, the, the federations in the US, but don't see that very much in, in Australia because that's not a thing that WADA uh, sees as, as valid. Um, but anyway, so, um, and you get a different response when you talk to some of the folks who are on like a cycling team. You get a different response when you're talking to some of the individual athletes in team sport and some of the athletes and some of the bodybuilders who are interviewed in this, this, this protocol. Um, so from that study, um, the coaches aren't often the ones giving it out. Um, and if you think about kind of the psychology of athletes, a lot of the time it's going to be the athletes looking for an edge and taking it and then not telling their coach about it. Or sometimes you do get a very, what I would call it like a toxic gym environment where the coach does, he's the distributor for, for a gym that does happen and has been reported to happen. And I can think of a few in the weightlifting community. Uh, it's kind of their, their secret sauce for their gym and they have a connect, they have a way of doing it. They know somebody and they, they can, they can try to get, um, that, that under the radar and they know how to help the help their athletes beat the test. Uh, or there are specific online coaches who are the guy who knows how to help you take the right stuff at the right times and when to cut it off to not get caught in drug tested events. I can think of back when I was on the muscular development forums, um, there was like, I don't, I don't want to specifically call anybody out, but there was a well-known uh, icon in the bodybuilding drug scene who would just literally just out in the open on the muscular development forums get asked, how do I beat the uh, the team universe test, which is the uh, back in the day, it was the, the one amateur um, natural bodybuilding event in the NPC, which leads to the IFBB. So that's where people are going to be go competing and where you can only be effective as a pro uh, back then uh, in because there was no men's physique division. There was no uh, tested pro events like the Ben Wheaters Naturals now that's happened in the last couple of years. Uh, back then, basically, there was no men's physique. There was no classic physique. Uh, there was just bodybuilding. It was the mass monster era. There's no Sean Roden at the time. This was in the middle of Ronnie Coleman's dominance. So if you wanted to be a pro bodybuilder in the IFBB, you couldn't even turn pro uh, unless you were you were on gear. And there was one place where you potentially could, but then you would get your pro card and be like, I, I retire. Like I've reached the pinnacle for a natural athlete. And that was winning the overall the team universe. And this was a not very well drug tested event. But it was a build as a natural event, and there were some top-level guys who I know are natural who could at least do well. Yeah. Uh, and, and a few who actually did turn pro. Um, so, but again, then they're, they're kind of done. But a lot of people looked at it as an opportunity to go against a, a field of, of folks who maybe they could beat, get their pro card, and if they could go, be on gear and have a competitive advantage, then they, then they would then get on all the gear uh, once they turn pro. And he would openly answer questions about how to beat the Team Universe tests in an open forum. Not even on the dark web, not a secret forum, nothing like that. Just So anyway, 
Um, that, that's kind of how it happens. But that's athletes seeking out a guru who's known for that. And that is also a very niche, niche situation. But anyway, going back to this qualitative interviews, um, some of the team sport athletes expressed that it was pressure from the rest of the team to say, hey, um, for all of us to do well, we all need to be on gear. We need to get that competitive advantage. Um, and the pressure was even greater on something like a, or like a relay team, like 4x4 or 4x1. Uh, you know, you've got three guys who are on gear, one guy who's not. Like, hey, man, get with the program. So they, they expressed that they felt pressure from their fellow athletes. Uh, the team sport athletes felt like a sense of uh, responsibility that they had to do everything in their power to be a good contributing member of the team. Um, so that was primarily from other athletes or then the bodybuilder uniquely expressed that he believed everyone in, in, in the bodybuilding federation that he was a part of um, was, was, was cheating. So it wasn't cheating. That was basically how he saw that. Um, and this is a total tangent and an aside but this is one of the reasons why why I agree that the polygraph is probably not a valid or it's, it's an imperfect uh, drug testing tool. I do think that the stance of the organization goes a very long way with whether or not someone is going to attempt to cheat and compete in that organization. So there's many, 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 many natural bodybuilding organizations. Some of them are much more serious about it than others. Uh, so for example, I'm aware of a uh, Australian Natural Bodybuilding Federation that uh, around the same time as this study was published, didn't do a single test, uh, although they called themselves a natural bodybuilding organization. So if this gentleman competed in that federation, I can totally understand why he might have thought that this was just, yeah, we're quote unquote natural. But then, for example, you have organizations like the IMBF, WMBF, um, where to get on stage, you have to take a polygraph. And then if you win your pro card or if you're a pro, you get a urine test afterwards as well. And then they do some limited random testing. And the heads of the organization or the promoter talks about natural bodybuilding at the beginning of each uh, federation kind of talks about the mission statement of the organization. So there's a cultural ethos around this federation that says, no, 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 this isn't a quote unquote natural organization. We're, we're very serious about this. We're doing everything we can. And you see a very different level and occurrence and frequency of people who are uh, cheating or look suspect. Uh, you see lower stage weights. Uh, and, and it just it, it just seems like it's it's a much more legitimate natural organization because of that cultural ethos. Since there's a bodybuilding show every damn Saturday somewhere in the U.S., if you're the person who's trying to cheat, where are you going to go? You're going to go to the ones that do in, inconsistent urine testing and are kind of like, yeah, you know, we're fine with this and that. And it's it's more so just so your your mom feels good about it. Or you'd go compete in an untested event. I would so compete I think, where I had the highest likelihood of winning, so I'd compete in the most natural one actually and then you would yeah but but the, someone who's, who's cheating would be like all right what's the, i have to no balance. i'm cheating eric what's coach the... i'm saying i'm cheating bro if i'm cheating i want right, to compete you... against those that are weakest which are <clears throat> those that are clearly natural you gotta cheat better bro it's, uh, <laughs> it's not working no 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 what no, no one thinks you're on gear omar <laughs> um <laughs> he's crying yeah so yeah but but i think i think that is something that people consider is you definitely don't want to get caught you know, because a lot of the times people are cheating for exposure. You know, they, they want to share the fact, hey, I'm promote them a natural bodybuilder. And some of these federations will post publicly that you failed. Um, you know, so uh, you, you want to there, there is a risk to going into a polygraph event. Uh, like what if you don't get on stage? What what do you say to your followers? Like, oh, I got sick the day before, you know, maybe. But um, but the point being is that the cultural perception of how natural a sport is or not how natural natural bodybuilding organization is is probably just as important as the quality of the testing itself really quick aside it's so funny that you said that uh, eric about getting sick before a competition or before a show i won't say the name of the individual but there's someone now who is very well known in the untested community that at the time had not stuck their neck out as to where they would be that had very good numbers and let's say a very large powerlifting or weightlifting the competition was set to make some pretty huge numbers and maybe something happened before they were training for it they're ready they're this and that and then the day before the actual competition they pulled out and then they took a year away came back untested and they've kept you know competing as such but just an intro well you said like what are they going to do say they're sick i'm like that's what they said to their followers <laughs> it's so funny that you yep. said that yeah 
One one thing, Eric, where you said that uh, it's on the level of the testing, uh, it's quite interesting to note that historically it wasn't until the year 2000 that out of competition testing was performed by WADA. And so before that, um, you were only going to get tested on the day of the competition or at a competition. Uh, so our competition testing is is the most effective way to catch people um, because most people nowadays just realize they can't take things in the run up to a competition because if they get drug tested is so much better now than it was uh, back in the 80s that it's likely we'll get caught. Um, uh, I think it'd be it'd be cool to end with just some little statistics about about recent testing. So, because I think I painted uh, a picture that anti doping is, is rubbish, and that in the eighties you could juice right up to a competition and no one would catch you. Uh, that's not necessarily how it goes nowadays. Uh, if you were to be using the same drug cycle that someone was using in the nineteen, uh, you know, seventy six, nineteen eighty, nineteen eighty four Olympics, uh, nowadays you would definitely get caught with that um back in the day in the in the early tests in the in the mid to late 70s where the oral anabolic steroids only had maybe a few weeks at best as a detection window uh, that's not the case anymore um Particularly, it's been discovered in uh, 2012, uh, Gregory Rechenkov, the guy that's the sort of maverick Russian scientist in the movie Icarus. He has published research discovering new long-term metabolites for uh, these oral steroids, um, Terinovo in that case. But since then, there has been the long-term metabolites discovered for all of the classic oral anabolic steroids, Winstrol, uh, Anavar, Dianabol, Terinabol. And the detection window from small to low dosages is now no longer weeks, uh, but many months and is directly impacted on how much somebody takes uh, tags and how long it is put in their urine. But you're looking at a detection window of months and uh, at this point uh, and well over six months is 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 possible. Um which is is good for the anti-doping authorities, but it means the athletes uh, that were using those drugs are now more likely to get caught. Um, but because that technology, uh, those metabolites were not even known to science until 2012. They didn't even know they existed. Um, they had no ability to detect for them. Um, but since 2004, uh, all Olympic samples are now being stored for 10 years. And... Um, we can already see by the fact that they've gone back and they've defrosted urine samples that were collected and retested them and searched for these new long-term metabolites that they are indeed catching athletes. And the statistics on this are actually quite alarming because in 2008 in the Beijing Olympics, only seven athletes tested positive during the Games. But now when they've defrosted the urine and gone back and looked for long-term metabolites, they've actually found that 65 athletes uh, were, ta were taking these oral anabolic steroids in the Beijing Games. Yeah. 2012 Olympics in London, it's a similar story. Nine athletes test positive during the Games. And when they now go back and look, it turns out 60, 60 athletes were actually using these oral anabolic steroids. And you can envisage what happened at the time was that they – at the time, they'd stopped their oral anabolic steroid cycle a certain number of uh, weeks out from the Olympic Games. The, the short to medium term metabolites that were known at that time that would looked inside their urine to try and see if they were taking those drugs, they were not there. So they cleared their system. But the long term metabolite that wasn't even known to science, they, they didn't even know to look for it, was discovered in 2012. And then it turns out the long term metabolite was present. And because these are diagnostic metabolites, there's no other way they're getting in your system without you taking that drug. Because it's synthetic, then you will regard it as of, of having consumed it. Uh, and then it comes down to the argument of did they take it uh, on purpose or inadvertently. But either way, they're going to get their medal removed. Um, and it's actually turned out that in 2008 and in 2012, there were two uh, people, two athletes now. Uh, one was a, a wrestler from Uzbekistan who won a gold medal in 2008 and in 2012, and in both instances was using oral anabolic steroids. And the other very famous person in the strength community was Ilya Ilin, who was uh, taking oral anabolic steroids in the 2008 and 2012 Olympic Games. And it's just to note the level of doping with these oral anabolic steroids, where at the time they were all testing fine, they weren't testing positive. Um, the biggest hit category by far was Ilya Ilin's weight class in 2012, the men's 94 kilo category. Uh, six out of the top seven competitors have now been charged with doping violations with the reanalysis of their urine. And so all the medalists that stood on the podium on that day 
have since tested positive. And so the Iranian lifter that came fifth on the day has actually been upgraded to first. The South Korean that came eighth has got the silver medal. And the Polish lifter who came ninth has now been awarded the bronze medal from London 2012. But then in Rio 2016, he himself then tested positive. Um, so that just goes to show you the level of usage of the oral anabolic steroids and people stopping in the run up to the games at the Olympics. Um, three other Kazakhstan lifters who won gold medals in the 53, 63 and 75 kilo categories and as females, uh, they also um, lost their gold medals because of this. Um, and now only recently Olympic weightlifting is being confirmed on the Paris 2024 program because this level of doping was so bad. Um, but People think, what's the point in us looking back and removing the medal for someone from an Olympics that was in Beijing over 10 years ago now or in London that was seven years ago? But that, in the mind of the anti-doping authority, shows that um, the drug cycle that somebody was using in 2012 is now detectable if you're deciding to dope with those classic oral anabolic steroids. If you do that now, you will get caught. And so even though, yes, it means that medals are getting redistributed seven years later to people it at least shows that anti-doping science has improved and the detection capabilities have improved to the point where now what was undetectable even in 2012 is now detectable uh, and though and rightfully so those athletes are uh, broken the rules so they're, they're losing their medals um so yeah, that's just incredible because to... i think a lot of people online will will, will say things like yeah that that the drug tests are, are way behind the athletes. And even though they are, I think most athletes, they want a legacy. They, they want to go down and, and like if they win a medal, it's not just on the day, then they don't care anymore. They want to be known as I was the, the world champion in 2010 or 2012 or whatever when I retire. And I think that's a huge motivation to not dope, to know that they could lose that and to realize just how effective these retrospective tests are. I had no idea that it was six, like like the the entire top six, you know, got got washed out. That that's that's incredible. I mean, yeah, that, in one that way, is, um, yeah, and yeah, so that, in that, that's in, nuts. In, in total, Eric, fifty five weightlifters over the two Olympics were were sanctioned because because of the discovery of the long term metabolites of the oral steroids. So at the time they could have had a clear conscious that they were never going to get caught but because the science improved they now have been caught uh, it's a crazy crazy statistic and that's why olympic weightlifting was put on probation to be removed as an olympic sport because mm -hmm. it was the worst and the hardest hit out of the discovery of these longer term metabolites of oral steroids um so it goes to show you know i think you're right about the legacy aspect one thing i would just just say on that is um Olympic samples are being stored for 10 years and this has proven to be a good deterrent now because it's shown that what you were doing in 2012 is now going to get you caught but at the time was not getting you caught but it's interesting that there's now pressure to store samples from other events because for example the Asian games they only store samples for three months. And that, mm. that's that's a continental championship. Three months later, those samples are destroyed because they don't have the freezer space to continue storing them. So we can't go and retrospectively investigate with new technologies if people at the Asian Games were doping more than three months later. The um, European championships, uh, the European Games, uh, when they have a, a, a cross-continental event where there's many sports happening at the same time, that, that's the event I'm talking about. That's a year and a half. And the, the Pan American Games at the moment is uh, just one cycle, so four years. So all these other events, athletes might be taking things um, and then their legacy is intact, even if the science mm -hmm. improves. Whereas in the Olympics, the legacy might not be intact if the science improves because the samples are being stored for long enough that the science can get to a point that it can uh, catch the people. And that was how Lance Armstrong was caught through retrospective analysis, correct? Uh, well, he never tested positive himself. Uh, there were m many other different lies of evidence uh, from other from testimonies from other people, um, and uh, that was, I think, I believe ultimately how they ended up catching him. Uh, and oh, then he. I, then I just thought I could be wrong, but I thought they looked at stuff from two thousand nine, two thousand ten, and actually found uh, evidence of doping. But I, I could be wrong. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, is uh, I'm not sure with with that, but I I know the story goes. I'm more I know more about this this uh, steroids than the doping. Lance Armstrong, he he did take testosterone and growth hormone, admitted to that, but he a lot of that was blood doping and EPO uh, mm -hmm. doping. But 
um, at the uh, the evidence was getting to the point of being overwhelming from testimonies from other people and from various different points and other people testing positive around that time that uh, uh, he then uh, admitted it on the Oprah Winfrey show quite famously and uh, uh, said how everyone was basically doing it at the time. And again, he said the same thing, where it's, it's not cheating if everyone else was doing it. And the same thing, the drugs that he was using at that time, EPO, had very, very small detection window, blood doping, and still to this day, doping with bags of blood is still actually undetectable um, in, in, in micro doses. If you use a very large amount of blood and put it back into your body, like three bags or more, then that that's likely to per, per, cause such large perturbation in your red blood cell count that statistically is too much of an anomaly. Whereas if you use one bag, that that's still currently undetectable and they're trying various different techniques now to try and catch people doing that potentially looking at plastic metabolites in your urine because the blood's oh, wow. been stored in plastic for so long that it then causes plastic metabolites in your urine um but even then glass you heard it here folks yeah and then uh, <laughs> it, helping it, cyclists is, improve performance here at iron culture yeah but you, you see this is where uh Athletes now that want to dope are having to move away from uh, synthetic drugs and have to go closer to more things that are naturally found in the body and taking very, very small doses of them with the hope that they don't cause statistical large enough perturbations in their their parameters within these biological passports that are monitored for their hormone values, their red blood cell count, in the uh, that they then that they then test positive and. Athletes have probably transitioned to a whole different, if they want to cheat, category of drugs from the 80s till now. Um, it's worth noting human growth hormone is one drug we haven't talked about, but that wasn't even a test, didn't even exist to 2012. And even then and up till now, the detection window is still maybe only 72 hours and blood only. Oh, wow. uh, so if you're not getting blood tested, there's no way of proving you're taking growth hormone. It's degraded so quickly and not put in the urine. Uh, that there's no way of proving that that is there. And so uh, anti-doping authorities are trying to improve growth hormone testing because they realize that's one way athletes could use it. But how much of a performance benefit is someone getting from microdosing growth hormone? Don't necessarily know the answer to that question. Uh, Literature is a bit inconclusive. Um, but athletes and, and also the other thing we haven't touched on is design steroids, which uh, is probably if you want to cheat the test is how you go about it now is you take a synthetic drug that's never been created before for human consumption. It creates metabolites that are not known to science. And that way you clear the test. And we know that athletes have done that in, in the past. The, um, Game of Shadows is a, is a fantastic book that did, uh, talks about the Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, the Balco scandal with Victor Conti, and mm-hmm. um, where he, the clear uh, tetrahydrogesterone, um, which is uh, the clear norbolethone, another drug that was used that athletes would take under the tongue. These were made by Patrick Arnold. He's admitted how he did it now. It, he's reckoned he only had to have about 20,000 dollars worth of chemistry equipment to make a designer steroid um, and it was just combining two steroids that were known in the literature uh, to create a new steroid that had never been used on humans before and the athletes were willing to, to use that because they knew it was undetectable and that is going to be an ongoing problem that is going to plague anti-doping forever and I've seen some research where they're trying to try uh, improve the detection on that and it seems to be one way they might do that is extracting metabolites that uh, have a rough steroidal backbone from urine and just seeing if they activate the androgen receptor in cell lines because if they mm. do then that's potentially a metabolite of a drug that someone has made to activate the androgen receptor in the human body but it's not creating a metabolite of the classic uh, oral steroids that have been known about on the other steroids for decades now um, do designer so, steroids still affect the tde ratio n- uh, no if they're not testosterone based no um, right. but they will affect other hormonal panels inside your body. So they still might shut down your internal testosterone. They still might cause your LH and FSH to go down to zero. So if you saw an athlete's blood panel and a hormonal panel change dramatically over a period of months that had the image of what a standard blood panel looks like after steroids have been used, but there's no metabolites in their urine that might lead to designer steroids being investigated but we have to be aware that the only reason designer steroids were ever found out in the first place was a track and field coach sent a syringe to the anti-doping agency that contained the designer steroids themselves um without that happening what victor conti and what was happening with balco would have would have would have never been discovered um right 
So it, the, the drugs people are using to cheat has changed dramatically in the past 50 years. In the next 50 years, it's going to change even more. And as you said, it all comes down to the efficacy and frequency of, of testing, both in and out of competition, to, to truly deter uh, drug usage in sport. I remember. So Alex... Cool. And this may be something that, that you, 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 you're not an expert in, so feel free to, to punt if you don't know. But um, where, do, where do SARMs come into this? Um, and, and is that because they're, 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 they're not a, a steroid necessarily, but they are definitely a designer drug to enhance performance. Uh, is the detectability there? I, I know that I, I've seen athletes fail tests for, for using SARMs uh, recently. So it seems like they're easier to, easier to detect even if they are um, a new class mm. of drug. Yeah, so I mean, because SARMs are still, this is interesting, we're talking about the culture of drugs as well, but because SARMs are still in the clinical trial phase, anti-doping authorities have known, because they're a drug that's uh, selective to bind to the androgen receptor in muscle, but not in other tissues in the body, and is therefore potentially more anabolic, but less androgenic, and has less side effects. So it's it's a it's a good option to give to a, a woman who is having clinical muscle wasted disease that needs to increase her muscle mass. Um, because the clinical trials have been going on, the anti-doping authorities have known this is a drug that could be used to enhance muscle mass at performance and i know that they've been using those clinical trials as opportunities to collect urine to then conduct testing to then look at what metabolites are uh, i haven't seen any published literature that's been talking about time frames uh, of a detection window ca capabilities with sams um, not as much as you've seen with the long-term metabolites but they are detectable so the same they will be found if you're using them uh, don't know what the detection window is like but they have the potential to be to be found um, and talking about the culture of drugs is like you were saying you've seen where methyl testosterone you've, you've read about how that was that was available as a supplement and then it was taken away by the fda because of side effects um the same that we could say that pro hormone you know when the anabolic steroid control act came out in 1990 uh, they only put very fixed specific names in law that could not be sold anymore as anabolic steroids so the classic oral steroids are placed on there testosterone was placed on there but all you had to do was subtly modify these drugs add a hydrogen atom add a methyl group and you can then create a new drug that's by word not the same drug that's banned by law and therefore you could then sell that as a pro hormone or as a supplement and that was where things like androstenedione dione came came about and that's why in 2004 the anabolic steroid control act was updated to enable these designer drugs and these modifications of the backbones of drugs to be uh, illegal as well uh, as the authorities realized that was a loophole. And with SARMs, I feel like that's similar to what's going to be happening in terms of legislation um, is already there's been a bit of a crackdown on supplement companies that are selling SARMs. Um, because they are not approved for human consumption yet. They are still in, in clinical trials. But in the next five years, it's highly likely they're going to be approved as a drug to be given to people. Uh, LGD, uh, 4033, Ligandrol, it's called, and Osterine are probably the two ones that are going to get approved uh, straight away in the near future. And once they get approved for human consumptions, you can imagine the law is going to change with the FDA, where it's going to be illegal to start selling what is a clinical drug to being given to people who are experiencing uh, either muscle wastage or uh, to try and, if someone's fractured their bone, is uh, their hip bone, is to try and help them increase um, the rate at which they recover from that injury and prevent them getting any degradation. And as we've seen many times now in history where a uh, new anabolic substance has come up and then it's been banned and put away, I think with SARMs, the same thing is going to happen. Uh, but because they are so widely available, even if the law changes, I'm sure there's still going to be ways that they can be purchased but it's no longer going to be as easy as now whereas me in the uk i get facebook ads selling psalms so it's incredibly easy to get a hold of them and i think in five years that's that's going to change once they get approved as a, a true clinical drug and we don't really know the the I mean, besides the ones that are, are in clinical trials and might get approved as a clinical drug soon the actual safety profiles just because they may not um have the androgenic side effects doesn't mean they might not have other side effects, uh, which is something that I think is a misconception in the supplement industry. They go, oh, it's, you know, it won't shut down, it won't shrink your nuts, so they're, they're good to go, but we don't know whether they will cause other problems in the future. No, uh, but they will, they will shut down your own internal production of testosterone. Um, and so you might have to end up conducting post cycle therapy afterwards, or you might. If you're totally uneducated and you think it's just a, it's an equivalent supplement to, uh, you know, 
creatine, beta alanine, citrulline malate, you know, the, those kinds of things. It's really not. It's it's a drug that will um, shut down your internal testosterone production to some degree. Yes, it's dependent on how much you take, how long you take it for, etc. But everyone can react differently to that. And if you're not getting their blood work done, uh, you could end up with with variations that you then have to then take other things to counteract what, what you did. Um, and as you said, there is going to be no long-term uh, safety data on SARMs. Uh, even in the clinical trials, they've been shown to to uh, reduce sex hormone binding globulin. They've been shown to reduce good cholesterol in people's blood values and been shown to reduce testosterone values. Um, so there are some things that are known, but to what extent the if you take them for longer than what the clinical trial is, and ultimately in dosage is way higher than the clinical trial. Because um, this is a kind of drug I don't think most people even know what you just said. I think most people... Yeah. Their perception Don't of SARMs that. is that it won't affect the HPTA axis. It won't result in, in, in the shutdown of natural testosterone. It won't affect cholesterol. They, they, the general perception out there is they're magic steroids. It's a, it's they're a steroids super supplement. No side effects. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but, it's I just mean, I mean, all I the mean, positives know, and none uh, of the I'm negatives. Sure. Yeah. Uh, it... Maybe molecular weight for molecular weight is going to have less androgeni- androgenicity than other drugs, but it's still, like you said, it's, it's going to shut you down. Um, I mean, I don't know if you saw the the Sarmageddon series where that was run on Mark Bell's channel. Um, he reviewed his blood work at the very end of that, and yeah, his testosterone had gone down. His sex hormone binding globulin had gone down. His good cholesterol had gone down. Uh, he was willing to accept those risks to his health. Um, but it is in the data in the clinical trials that these things happen to people, and mm-hmm. this is with low dosages. And when these drugs come out, it's probably going to be two milligrams. Someone's going to be prescribed to help their bone density recover from a hip fracture, um, which is very different to 30 or plus milligrams that somebody might be taking. Um uh, so, like you said, then they're not they're not going to be totally side effect free. And with anything that we've been talking about, and any time people talk about drugs, it's best to talk about a harm reduction approach where people should just be educated before they use anything. If they're not breaking the laws within their country, it's their own choice. But you might as well be as educated as possible to try and prevent any unnecessary harm to yourself um, to enable that you're as, uh, being as safe as possible if you decide to go down that route. I hear oftentimes the uh, remark by some people when they'll say that, Alex, we say, yeah, you got to, you know, weigh the pros and cons and uh, see if you're willing to take the health risks. And there's kind of that cavalier uh, devil may care attitude. Like, yeah, bro, but who wants to live forever? I'm like, I want to have a life that is not negatively affected by the things that I ingest just for, you know, trying to enhance my physical appearance. But it it's interesting just talking about the culture. I mean, you brought that up and I actually remember when Lance Armstrong on Oprah admitted it, and it was iconic, almost as iconic as when Tom Cruise uh, jumped on the couch. <laughs> Not nearly as close, but just in terms of the weight, the guilt that he felt because of the perception, once again, in the culture and what it meant, what it signified when it came to who, what he represented, you know, and who he was, which is why Carl Lewis... The Lewis, Livestrong when, brand. Yeah, exactly. When Carl Lewis took the hit, it was a big deal. But now there, there's almost like this... I don't know if I'd call it a, a postmodern uh, attitude or something where you were giving me the statistics. I think people are in ways aware, and I don't know if this will be the last topic, but I think in ways people are aware of some of the potential side effects. You know, intellectually they know it. Maybe they don't know how it will obviously feel, but they still go through with it. Where Were you not giving me this uh, statistic, Alex, of recreational users transient users in the uk how it's soaring uh over the last few years were we we were talking about either off camera or on the episode i forget uh yes that's right there statistically with surveys that are conducted that there has been a, an increase in um more uh by quite a large percentage point of people that are admitting that they take anabolic steroid users, uh, anabolic steroids. And in most instances now, when the people are surveyed, they're people that are using anabolic steroids, they're, they're not using them to dope. Well, they're not admitting that in the surveys anyway. Uh, they're not using them for even competitive, untested bodybuilding or powerlifting. They're just using them as, as recreational drugs as their own choice, which is why I think any time drugs in sport is discussed is just statistically the people, most people that are using these are recreational users. Um, the harm reduction should be the forefront of any conversation because it's a matter of trying to safeguard people's health as we move into an era now where people know a lot more about steroids. It's far more common. 
it's talked about way more in social media whereas you could go back where you know people didn't even know pro bodybuilders was using steroids and nowadays it's people talk about it way more often and yep. so it's spreading culturally and more people are becoming exposed to it and everyone therefore should be very much educated on how to use these things properly uh, to make sure they safeguard their health when they decide to use any any of the drugs you've mentioned yeah eric i want to talk about informed choice that you mentioned at the start of the episode because just as a slight side tangent a few years back I went into a grocery store when we talk about how prevalent anabolic steroids are, the discussion or the normalization versus, let's say, 30 or 40 years ago. And this guy, I was just buying some deli meat, uh, and the guy's like, you go to the gym? I said, yeah. He's like, yeah, you know, you look like you lift. He said, I started whatever, and he named his stack. I wasn't, you know, paying attention. And he just mentions it to me. I don't know who this individual is. First off, how little he understood about what he was taking was scary to me. Because he basically said that he was going to do cardio. He wanted to build muscle and lose fat. And he basically kind of when we said the transient lifters, Alex, he had a vacation coming up, a summer vacation, and he wanted to look good. So he decided to start using anabolic steroids. And as he understood it, and I, I, I didn't even want to unpack it because I'm like, this is a waste of my time. You're uninformed and you don't even want to be informed. I'm just here to buy some turkey breasts and get the fuck out. But he uh, said, I'm going to do cardio because it's going to melt the fat away and then I'm taking these drugs because it's going to build the muscle and I was like "Uh uh-huh uh-huh cool and then I just got out of there but when we talk Eric on Iron Culture about informed choice I I like our niche the shout out to the culture um, where it's all about trying to inform individuals before they make the choices we're not saying there were anti-drugs or anti-anabolics but you definitely need to consider everything before you make such a monumental choice and looking at that guy how inconsequential he viewed it in his mind and how to him you know Alex we talked about the side effects and the potential negative consequences there were none yeah yeah and that that's you know if we did we go back to my my personal journey with lifting back in 0506 I used a a a handful of of uh, pro hormones back in the day uh, right at kind of the tail end of, of, of that era when it was, you could get them at GNC, you could order them at bodybuilding.com. Um, and I had a very cavalier attitude. I was in my young 20s, and I didn't have any kind of underpinning philosophy or thought of going into what I was doing. It was just very all outcome-based and impulsive decisions in the moment and just really no recognition of, of, of what my decisions were making or how my decisions would affect me long-term. Um, and the... I think if we go back to uh, our episode with Chip Conrad, when he talked about people don't have philosophies, they don't, they don't have philosophies of why they train a certain way, why they're doing what they're doing. Um, the difference between me now and me then, you know, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, was that I did not have a full understanding of my own motivations, my own desires, and what I truly wanted uh, and why I was doing it. Um, and I hadn't been exposed to the existence of natural bodybuilding. I wasn't thinking of being a competitor. Uh, I wasn't thinking about why I was doing what I was doing. And because it came from a semi-negative place of why I got into lifting, uh, almost kind of like this therapeutic and kind of extreme attitude, um, I was disconnected from my own values, my own beliefs when I made what would seem like an inconsequential decision. And a part of that was that there wasn't a ton of uh, information out there as to what the the gravity of that decision would be. So I think that is a good first step is to just make sure that people do have access to information. And then the second one, unfortunately, the onus always falls on the individual is you really need to kind of know thyself and then ask those hard questions before you make decisions. But it's easy to make a decision when you don't see the gravity to it. So I think hopefully that's what what Alex has really helped us do here today. you know, because, you know, I, I, I would love to say I'm lifetime natural, but because of a, a handful of weeks and when I was in my early 20s, um, you know, I, I, I can't. And, and I get thrown in the bus all the time like, oh, yeah, he's half, half natty, Eric. You yeah. know, yeah. You know? um, and, uh, you know, ironic, ironically, I wouldn't even qualify for the, the prior user uh, in, in your study. But the, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty, uh, 
I'm, I'm like maybe like one one sixteenth natty or, or 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 not natty or whatever. <laughs> you know what's even worse but, about um, that? Quickly, Eric is you the man. And you're someone that I find is just the real Captain America in the uh, fitness industry. It's amazing that you chose, unlike so many people, and as you said, is inconsequential, something that you could buy at a GNC. It's not like you went to the guy, as you said, with the trench coat that sold you bad anabolics and then also a side of Coke that was cut with baking soda. It's like this is a thing that you could legally buy. And so at the time, once again, because it's legal and you're trying to look for everything, What's amazing is you admit it and you uh, you vocalize it, and the vast majority of people are like, yeah, right on, man. And then there's that one percent that's like, yeah, but he's not lifetime natural. Though. I'm like, are you like, bro? Are you? Come on, what are we? <laughs> who? What? Like, what do you want out of these people? It's like you have someone being fully transparent and you don't like it, and yet this is the same person that probably looks up to their favorite Instagram lifter. I'm like, I got news for you about that guy, you know. Well, I, I think um, you know. There's people play telephone a lot too. Right. Like I, I, I've 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 observed people going like you know, Eric, Eric. No one knows this, but Eric secretly used used gear back in the day, and I, <laughs> I, I kind of look at that and go, the only reason anyone knows it is because I've openly disclosed <laughs> yeah. it. This isn't a secret, you know. But um, but you know, you know how it is. It's the yeah. internet, and yeah. you you can't take it too hard. But the point is, is that there's a lot of people. Who make decisions like I did? Yeah, um, I would say that that's a solid 30, 40 percent of competitive natural bodybuilders. You know, they many of them are 17, 18, 19 when they started lifting, and then they get exposed to it and they go, you know, that's not the lifestyle I want to live. I, I'd like to to, to be natural because now I developed a philosophy. You know, this is a more holistic purpose or path for me, and I I think it would be I think it's it's a bit of a a tragedy to like you know ban someone from from being part of that community or. or you know, to 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 condemn people for 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 figuring out who they are as a young young man or woman, and then making a, making a decision and a stand. Um, so so yeah, I, I think I think it's a good thing that we have you know like a ten year drug free rule, et cetera, versus lifetime. Yeah. Uh, but I also think it's really important, Alex's research, to figure out what what dosage, when, and why might that matter or give someone a performance enhancing effect. Yes. Um, but anyway, yeah. So so the uh, the I think the really important thing is that we need to have the information to be able to make an informed choice. And then for each individual out there, just to know the gravity of these decisions and then truly develop a philosophy, look inward and figure out why am I lifting? What does this mean to me? Because a lot of the people who make these decisions to, uh, to use anabolics, you know, if we go back to our eating disorder discussion, it comes from a negative self image. You know, and, and correcting something or it, quote unquote attempting to correct a problem because you're not good enough or you haven't met some standard. Um, but if you look at it from I'm doing this for holistic life betterment and to be the best version of myself and to see how far I can take myself and push myself um, and even extending it into sport. Like I want to see, you know, how far I, I can be against the, the others in a competitive field. There's really like it's not fun to win if you're cheating. That's why even in, in the instances of doping, uh, they convince themselves everyone else is doing it because it's very difficult to take uh, joy out of that achievement and, and pleasure and satisfaction if you feel that you won unfairly. You need to believe that everyone else is also uh, doing doing what you're doing so that it is it is a true quote unquote win. Uh, but, so but, I, but we know that there were instances in sport where everyone was doing it. <laughs> and, True. Uh, and Absolutely. that's just the way it was. Um, and they were either talking about it or they weren't talking about it. I mean, take take that 2012 Olympics men's 94 category where six of the top seven are testing positive. That Everyone there was taking steroids. So are you cheating when the other person on the podium next to you also was? In their no, that, that's actually a, a really good point, Alex. And I... I sometimes I feel it's easy for me to uh, because I'm not I'm, I'm in a sport where there is two paths, you know, all the sports I compete in, you know, the uh, uh, except for Olympic weightlifting, which I wouldn't even say I competed in because I was too shitty to, to even uh, be considered a competitor. But in uh, in powerlifting and in bodybuilding, um, there are two very clear paths because they're right. not Olympic sports, you know. Uh, you can decide to go enhance. You can decide to be drug free, and that, that's an interesting model. It's very different than the Olympics, where you have cultural pressure. You're representing your country. You have potentially team pressure if you're part of a sport where there's team. You might be there. Might be a doping program, or it might be a coach, or you might know that the difference between you placing tenth or winning 
uh, it would be to make a decision to use anabolics. And you know that the other guys in the top 10, like you just pointed out in the 94 category, are all using. Um, that is a, is a much more difficult decision than it is for, for a natural bodybuilder or, or a powerlifter to decide which federation they want to compete in, which route do they want to go. Um, and they have that option. So it's, it's yeah, I, 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 the, moral, the moral decision there is, is a much more murky one. And I, I, I've typically punted and, and, and gone and said, yeah, I don't know, I'm not an Olympic athlete. And I'm going to continue to do that to take the, uh, the easy way out of not having a position because I, I can't understand the pressures of being an Olympian. I can only understand the pressures of, of trying to be the, uh, the 2019 River City Classic. River City Champion. Royal Rumble. River City Royal Rumble oh, yeah. in the Bronx, oh, yeah. but not in the Bronx, in Sacramento. Jackie you know, Chan was there, so. though. Um, yeah, exactly. What I was... the equivalent. <laughs> what, what, what's the competition in, 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 in Karate Kid? Oh, the All State Valley uh, Regional Karate Tournament. All Valley. All Valley. All Valley. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. That that that's the kind of level of competition Eric Helms is at. So I don't have to worry about it too much. <laughs> well, hey, you you. Crank and there's kick- also a River River City Classic version that that is is enhanced. If I wanted to do that, so it's even easier to make the decision. <laughs> hey, Eric, you crane kicked your competitors just bap in the face. Even after the judge said no kicks to the head, you went with the crane kick because you knew you could get away with it. That's right. Yeah. When at all costs yeah. is the lesson yeah, of this that's episode. Lo- I want to say just quickly that Swe- I- Yeah, hashtag sweep the leg. <laughs> yeah, hashtag sweep the leg. I, I do uh, take pride, honestly, with this podcast in the sense that bringing on guests like yourself, Alex, helps to change the power asymmetry when it comes to the knowledge of these things, such as anabolic steroids, where there's, unfortunately, because it is a taboo, um, there's a lot of as you said, heresy, even about yourself, uh, Eric, what you hear, what people, what they think they do, what they think SARMs. I didn't know this. You know, I learned a few things in this episode. Alex blew my mind when he was on my YouTube channel talking about designer steroids. He blew my mind this time about SARMs uh, in terms of how, as I understood it personally, you know, you take SARMs and that there's no androgenic side effects. In addition to that, that it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't shut down. And I don't know why I naively thought that, you know, your own testosterone production, uh, just, just silly things like that being misinformed because again, the knowledge isn't out there. So in ways, when we say informed choices, like let's inform you about everything we talk about a lot. We had, when you said the eating disorder about uh, individuals, the philosophy of lifting, trying mm-hmm. to develop one and how that could dramatically alter your perspective when it comes to lifting and what you choose to do. I think it's just so important. So, you know, Alex, I'm, I'm really grateful for you being on the culture. Thank you. Yeah, man. So, uh, Alex, this is the point time point in the podcast where we just ask the guest if there's anything we didn't get to that you want to talk about. If, if Omar and I's tangents, which we have many, took us too far off the path. Anything you want to say before uh, we, we, we let you talk a little bit more about what you're doing and where people can find you? No, that was great. I think we discussed everything I wanted to talk about. Awesome. Well, then tell us again about your study, how people can contact you, kind of we'll, we'll bookend it with that because it's really important research. And then we'll let Omar do his outro thigh. Cool. Uh, so if you are a current anabolic steroid user living in Europe or a past anabolic steroid user living in Europe, uh, you can get involved in my research. You'd have to come to the University of Brighton campus in Eastbourne for uh, one day. Uh, the last weekend of October of 2019 is the next sampling dates as of currently recording this, but there will be more in 2020. Um, It'd be fantastic to get as many people involved as possible to give us some really good uh, data for statistical purposes to try and better understand androgen receptor binding, muscle growth at the molecular level. And if you're a current user and you're going to go off cycle, we'll then invite you back six months later to see if your muscle exhibits a memory of that steroid exposure so we can better understand uh, if there are retained benefits after steroids. And there's never been any published literature that's monitored people whilst they cycle off anabolic steroids uh, so that we're going to try to to add that even if this the logistics of this study is incredibly difficult we're trying our best to add to that but even uh, if you're just a current user it'd be great for you to come to the lab so that we can look at the molecular pathways of growth and as if you're a past user see are your pathways like a current users or are they like someone that's not using steroid anymore 
so we can sort of look at that retained benefit. Um, best way to get in contact with me is to email me. Um, if you found this interesting, but you're not uh, going to be able to take part in the study, then um, I have a I've made an Instagram account. It's just got one post on it that details the study with an advert and some further details. It's Alex underscore K underscore T. You can easily find it there. Social media is proven the best way to get people. So if you share my advert, I'll be greatly appreciative for that. And as well, if you search Alex KT and muscle memory on Facebook, you'll see public posts that can easily be shared. And anyone that does that, I'm greatly appreciative of your help in contributing uh, towards my research. We will link that in the description for both YouTube and iTunes. I highly encourage if anyone can participate, they do so. It will only further enhance our community, no pun intended. I want to thank Alex for being on this episode of Iron Culture, where we explore the history, the science, and the culture of lifting. You can help us out by leaving a rating and review on iTunes. We read them all. I damn near cried. I actually screenshot some of them and send them to Eric and say, Who does? <laughs> I basically have a meltdown just like Tom Cruise with Oprah every single time. I jump on the couch, I make a fool of myself, and Oprah just stares at me thinking, This is great content for viewers. Um, but you can do that if you want. You could also leave a comment on YouTube. We do our best to respond. We are back every single Monday. We'll see everyone on that next episode of Iron Culture.